Hi, this is Mark Morell from Let's Voltron, the official Voltron podcast. We're here at RetroCon in Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, Pennsylvania, and we're talking to Gary Chalk, the voice of Sky Marshal Wade in Voltron Force, and he also did Manset. Welcome, Gary. Good morning, or good afternoon. How are you? Nice to be here. <laughs> so I'm also here with my co-host, Greg Tyler. Welcome, Greg. Gary, it's great to, to speak with you finally. Huge well, fan of Voltron Force. I am heard of a Voltron Force uh, uh, show, so it's kind of uh, kind of shocking because the only person who ever called me for Voltron is a, a friend of mine, Beach, who uh, lives in uh, Everett, Washington, and uh, she always uh, calls me up to say hello and does and she, has her her own Voltron drawings and and uh, is always showing me pictures of her assistance dog who's quite cute <laughs> so this is all new to me so um it's great to be here it's i i never realized that there was a a uh, a voltron group and i'm very pleased that there is thank you very much oh, well thank you we appreciate that uh there's a lot of fans out there that came back to voltron after a long absence because it was voltron defender of the universe in 1984 and then it was voltron the third dimension in the late 90s right but then in 2011 came voltron, voltron force force yeah and voltron force was was quite it was quite fun because i i had heard of voltron before voltron force was recorded and i thought did you guys already do a voltron force wouldn't there and I remember there was a there was a, a time when they said yes we're going to do Voltron for us and I said um, when uh, well we don't know yet but it's going to be recording soon and uh, then they recorded within the next couple of weeks and uh, I started the show and I started the show with some new voices and some uh, some of the older time voices which was uh, quite fun and uh, we started recording the show and i thought well this is kind of interesting and i got to play a character that i don't normally play which is a bad guy mm -hmm. yeah. and a russian guy which was lots of fun <laughs> and who alien guy no he's supposed to be a bad guy but well you think he's a bad guy because he's a smuggler and he does all these underhanded things but actually he's a good guy yeah <laughs> we're talking about right, man on the other hand <laughs> he's not a good guy at all he comes across as the defender, but basically he's stabbing them all in the back. Yes. Yeah. So, how did it feel to audition for a bad guy? Well, the 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 one thing I love about auditioning for bad guys, bad guys always get the best lines. I don't know why. Call me crazy, but being the good guy, you get all the straight lines. You're like the straight guy to all the the sidekicks, and you're always forever going. <sighs> Or, oh no, <laughs> or not again, never, bad guy. And then they come up with some really snappy retort was, I'll see you in that dark place, you silly straight guy. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to be a good guy because you get all the straight lines. The bad guy has it easy. And so I just played myself basically, as a bad guy, a darker side of myself, which is easy to find because we all have our bet noirs, as they say. So anyway, so that's what I did. I just found a darker side of myself and played uh, Sky Commander Wade, and it was, it came out, and they liked it, and so I said, great, let's, let's go. <laughs> so in the beginning, uh, Sky Marshal Wade actually had the lines sort of locked up, and he had the keys, yes. and they had to get those keys back from him. Yes, and it was no mean feat because, but losing the uh, losing the lines meant losing control, and basically what he wanted was complete power over everyone. And uh, at the academy, he's always watching, watching for 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 people doing just that, trying to get control of the cats. And for a time, they do, I believe. Yeah, there was a, there was a time when Wade actually took over Voltron, and it was unbelievable for all us fans. And uh, that was uh, that was quite something when it, when that happened. And uh, we're going, I have the ultimate power. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, which I thought was pretty amazing. Though I was a, a bit um, bemused by, I think I turned blue or something, or I had a blue aura. If I, is that is that is that right? I can. Yeah, so, so I, I had a blue aura, yeah. Yeah. So Sky Marshal Wade is standing inside of the 
open mouth of the, the Voltron yeah. head and this holographic Wade face appeared, a yeah. blue tinted Wade face. That's yeah. the one, the blue tinted Wade face. And I'm going, okay, it's getting weird now. <laughs> but, um, but it got even weirder, didn't it? I know. And it got even weirder because he got, he, he got Sky Commander Wade got consumed by this darkness and he became even more dark than he was, you know, like in the middle of the show. I mean, the beginning, he was, he was just an ass, you know. But, I mean, a pompous kind of dude. But then, but that, as the thing went on, he got, he got darker and darker and then he started to go insane. Yeah. And then it ended. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Yeah. yeah no, it was it was great. We were upset that there wasn't a, a, a follow up season. You know, we were waiting for more episodes, and it just never happened. You were upset. <laughs> we were waiting for that second season, and they kept, "Yes, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming." Well, where is it? And we waited and waited, and nothing happened. Nothing happened, and, and I thought, "Oh, that that's, the show's gone now." But then I think it got re resumed, didn't it? Well, what ended up happening was there was actually a book called Voltron from Days of Long Ago. I have that right here. Yeah. No product placement there. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what they have at the end of the book here is a comic of Voltron Force where they continue the story. Just a little bit. Yeah. Kind of, it's kind of an epilogue. Uh, Oh, and other Sorry. things fell out too, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So that was it. Sort of continued the story just a bit. Just a bit. Yeah. But there wasn't a new series after that. Uh, I mean, there's a current one on Netflix, but it's a whole different thing. Yeah, that's what I mean. That they 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 started a new show, but yes. it was nothing like the original show. That's right. No. So I thought that a bit odd. So I went, oh, so you just didn't want to make me crazier, you know? <laughs> you didn't want me to rule the world or destroy it or destroy the cats. But we never did, so I'll never know. But uh, I can say that uh, you know it was uh, it was a great fun character to play because I don't get to play bad bad guys very often. So, so other than Sky Marshal Wade, what have been some of your favorite characters you've ever played? Well, um, so many of them. I um, I loved playing uh, Grounder on Sonic the Hedgehog, and I loved playing Dr. Robotnik on Sonic the Hedgehog. That was a lot of fun. I loved playing a character named King Hippo in Captain Nintendo, who was hilarious because my sidekick was an eggplant, which is weird in itself, eggplant wizard. And he, he was always going, I didn't do it. And I was, going, and I was always going, what are you doing? <laughs> And uh, and it was a great fun part because they were like the the idiot sidekicks, and they're always getting themselves into trouble. And that was a great character. I love playing uh, Optimus Prime. It was always fun. Or out and Optimus Primal. Um, he Man Masters of the Universe. That's one of those straight characters that had all the, um, you know, Skeletor. You're a bad, bad man. You've got to change your ways. And that never happened. So I had all the straight lines and, uh, and all the public service announcements at the end, which were always fun. Until next time, you know. Um, those ones, uh, one of my favorite characters was a character called Captain Flannel on Captain Z and the Z Patrol which was basically a team of uh, dream patrollers who would go to kids' places, and if they had nightmares, we'd intercept the nightmares or fight off the nightmares. Wow. And huh? That's a great concept. I never heard of the show. Yeah, because it's from Britain. It's an English movie or an English cartoon series. Uh, I've did a few English cartoon series that uh, never made it here to, uh, to America. But Captain Zed was very funny. They had uh, a control room. It's a like, uh, nightmare approaching in uh, in Jimmy's house, fourteen twenty three, somebody Lane. Uh, send an intercept, and then we would go out, and I would go, Commander. I was Captain Flannel. Commander, Commander, you never send me on these missions. What's wrong with me? I'm fabulous. And uh, 
They say, well, Captain Flannel, someone has to hold the ship. But I don't want to hold the ship. I want to stop the nightmares. And then we go and get the, uh, the nightmares were Snork and Snurt, who, uh, who are evil, who, who would do things like insert, you know, horrible songs like, uh, there's one song, you know, this is a song that'll get on your nerves, get on your nerves, get on your nerves. This is a song that'll get on your nerves, get on your nerves, get on your nerves. <sighs> this is a song that'll get on your nerves. And they do it over and over and over again. Or the belch organ was... And they'd play the belch organ to that song. And they'd try and, and they, would, they would, you know, realize all, you know, the kids' nightmares, like going to school with no pants on or... or uh, uh, waking, uh, waking up and finding their homework was gone or they were lost somewhere or, you know, uh, the kids' dreams. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd go and intercept them and the control station was hel held up by a head sheep <laughs> and all the tech workers in the control room were all sheep. Wow. And uh, so they, you know, because you're counting sheep to go to sleep and all that. And so they were all sheep. And we rode on a giant mattress spaceship and... Uh, it was, it's, totally, we got to check this guy got really high and went, Hey, you know what, man, you know, we should make like this dream patrol. They come flying around a mattress, you know, and there you have pillows for chairs. And, uh, and then there's the control room is like sheep, you know, and they're always doing stuff. And the nightmares are like, like little creepy crawly things. And then we just go and save the kids from the nightmares. It's kind of cool. Whoa, pass me another one. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but it was really, really funny. Sure. We got to check this show out. Exactly. I'd love to see it. Now, Now, over your career to this point, any medium, anything you've done professionally, what are you the most proud of? Uh, well, several things. Um, I was most proud of um, Optimus Prime because uh, I got to follow in the footsteps of Peter Cullen. And another guy from Voltron. And another guy <laughs> from Voltron. Also from Canada. Yes. Because uh, he was uh, born in Montreal. And um, that one, because I, I managed to not only step in, create a new character for Optimus, but also make it a character that people really liked. So that was a proud achievement. Um, uh, I did a, a, a huge mini series with. Um, with uh, Farrah Fawcett Majors uh, in a, a miniseries called Small Sacrifices where it was my first real meaty uh, role as her husband as a co-star. And uh, I was very proud of that. I was also very proud of Cold Squad, which was a series that ran for six years or seven years in Canada where I played the, um, the chief inspector and ran the gamut of emotions throughout the show and uh, won a couple of awards uh, back to back for the for that show the first I think it was the first actor to win the uh, the award for the same character two years in a row which was quite a proud accomplishment for me and um, not only that but I love the show and and overall I just um, well, I don't think there's anything in my entire resume that I'm not proud of, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some things that I, I, I like more than others, let's say. But, you know, just like any actor, when you first start out, you, you, uh, you look at stuff and you go, oh, I didn't do that. I did do that. <laughs> But, but when, you, when you, the more and more that you watch yourself on TV, and because uh, I could not watch myself on TV, I never watched myself because every time I thought it was awful. But the reason why is because I'm looking inside from from where I am, and I look at me and I go, "Oh, lie, 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 lie," and but nobody else is seeing it, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing it because I know, you know. And then after a while, I, I I've got to I've gotten to a point, uh, you know, several years ago where I can watch a show and go, "Yeah, I can like this character. This is great. Okay, I'm happy with it." So that's uh, that's uh, that was a proud sort of a turning point in my career, but uh, only took twenty years. No. When when you recorded on Voltron Force, did you guys record as an ensemble or did, did you do it by by yourself? Uh, we recorded ensemble, and the reason we did that is because um, 
when you record ensemble, you're recording, uh, you know, you're speaking face to face with the characters you're talking to rather than a blank wall or a microphone because uh, microphones don't wink or smile or do anything. They just stand there. And so you just sort of don't, am I doing it right? And um, I enjoy ensemble because ensemble, ensemble playing is, well, for one thing, it's more organic. And it's, um, it's very um, quick. You can record much quicker. And you get, you know, chunks of scenes rather than just saying a line. Because when you're sing when recording singly, and I've done that as well, sing or we're recording singly, you, you have to do the, the lines like three or four different ways and four takes for each one. Right. Because they want to make sure that yours matches up the responses from other characters. Hearing them, so you're sort of guessing what they're going to say or how they're going to say something. So you try different iterations of the same line, hopefully matching up with what they say. And uh, sometimes that can be a real pain in the butt because I would much rather have someone who I'm talking to and then I react off them. And that's a better way to do it. So most of the cartoons, I've, in fact, I think all of the cartoons we do in Canada except for... Um, uh, ADR with anime, you know, translating, is uh, done ensemble. Lip go kind of thing. Yes, the um, the ADR these days is so much easier. It goes beep 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 talk, and so when you when you get that beep beep beep, it's like beep bend beep bend beep bend talk. So it makes it a lot easier to to match the dialogue to the picture. In the old days, and uh, you know, back in the early '80s, and I hate to say the early '80s, the old days, but it is the old days. We did loops. We're at, and that's why they call it looping. And uh, they were actual loops. They were pieces of film looped together in a circle. They put it in a projector, and it would go around and around and around. And they'd have a black line here and a black line here on the screen. And when the two black lines met, like that, bang, you talked. Wow. And it took forever because they had to put the loop in, then take the loop out, put another loop in, take it out, take it in. It would take all day. Mm -hmm. Now it takes like, you know, 20 minutes wow. because it's all electronic. And a lot of times they have a thing called voice fit or word fit where you can you know, you can adjust the words and, and, and stretch the spaces between words to make them fit into the ADR. That works fine for anime. Not so much for uh, live action, but for anime it works very well. And uh, so it makes it a hell of a lot easier because what we were doing, oh, back in the day used to take forever. It was just like, it was like recording anything because we used to record on tape uh, you know, 24 track or 16 track tape, and uh, to do a th simple thing like a voiceover for a commercial would take, you know, an hour or two because and then they'd have to splice the tape when they do the edits if they want to edit a particular take that they really liked and splice it, and it had to be spliced just so. Now you can edit on the fly. You record, and then you can take a line. You can cut it in half and delete it and just punch in and record this part of the line and and you can take words literally words and glue them together yeah. it's it, if it uh, if you do it correctly you you can't tell but um, so it makes it a lot easier to do it in five minutes rather than taking an hour to do it so it's not a bad chore but uh, I pride myself in not having a lot of loops <laughs> Occasionally, you know, um, I had loops the other day, but it, the reason why is because the sound was distorted, because the sound uh, person had not set the levels properly. And I have a big voice, and so it can distort very easily. So I try not to um, try not to uh, speak. You know, like get out there and speak, because I can over, I can blast. I have a lot of vocal, what they call vocal pressure which can cause the microphone to go brah like that, and you don't want that. Does that come from your diaphragm? It comes from the tummy, yes. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny where I learned, because I, I, before I was in animation, 
I was uh, I was in the stock market for a while, and I was in in social work for a while, which gave me a lot of insight to things. I worked in that for a few years, and before that, I worked on the floor of the stock exchange uh, as a trader or assistant trader at that time because I was a junior. And uh, in order to be heard, you have 149 people all yelling on the floor at the same time, their bids and offers. And the only way you could get heard is to be loud and distinctive. But if you didn't do it right, you lost your voice on the first day. You go home like this. So my senior trader, Mr. Donaldson, he go, Gary, you got to speak from the tummy. If you don't speak from the tummy, you're going to lose your voice. So speak from here and support. So when I say, on the bit of batter, they could hear you on the other side of the room. And uh, that's what I did. And so that's where I developed this voice. And um, then I got into theater when I went back to college. I got into theater and... Um, I found that that helped me a lot on live stage, speaking to the back rows. And um, when I got into animation, the same thing. It was just, you know, you could control the voice and you get, you develop what they call cast iron vocal cords so you don't lose your voice. Well, that's, that's fascinating. I was just going to ask you how you, when you recognized that you had a voice that was appropriate for for animation and, and projecting and emoting as your as you do you do have a very unique vocal quality and i was curious about how that how you came to realize and and and, uh, and develop that well i um in high school i got kicked out of high school for a couple of days because i went into the office and i mim mimicked the voice of our vice principal <laughs> mr burr and he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, because of the, uh, the nature of the emergency we have in school this afternoon, everyone will have to go home at noon. <laughs> and everyone tried to go home at noon. And Mr. Burr came storming up. Who did that? Who did that? <laughs> Suspended for two days. Oh, All right. Well... We want to let you know that uh, a lot of fans came back to Voltron as a result of Voltron Force. So no matter how many seasons or how few episodes it was, you had a strong impact on people because your character, Sky Marshall Wade and Manset, were integral to the, to the story in, in Voltron Force. And it brought a lot of the fans back to Voltron, which have now even... Wow, they've skyrocketed now that Voltron Legendary Defender has come out on yeah. Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Have you I, seen it? I, I have looked at it. I haven't seen all of the shows because I, I, I must confess I don't watch a lot of cartoons because, well, I'm an old guy and uh, I like watching CNN. But, you know, I'm a news junkie. But uh, to all the fans out there, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being loyal. Thank you for watching the show and... Uh, I appreciate that uh, that uh, you like what I did. Thank you so much. All right, and thank you for joining us on Let's Voltron. <laughs> my pleasure. Oh my, let's go. All night. Let's go.